you for joining our men's health webinar. We'll start with a few housekeeping items. Then I'll introduce you to tonight's speaker. First, your participation in tonight's webinar is completely anonymous to other attendees. No one can see your face or your name. Any comments or questions you have can only be seen by myself and our speakers. If you wish to, ask, if you wish to ask a question, please type it in the chat box at the lower part of your screen. And we will have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation to address those questions. Our presentation tonight will last for approximately one hour and will be presented by ours truly, Dr. Matthew Rudder of the Graves Gilbert Clinic. Dr. Rudder has lived in Bowling Green for the past 12 years with his wife and kids. Dr. Rudder is trained at the University of Oklahoma and is a former associate professor at the University of Toledo College of Medicine. Dr. Rudder is the current medical director of robotic surgery and the chief of staff at TriStar Greenview Regional Hospital. Thank you for joining us tonight, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Rudder. Well, hello, hello everyone. It's, uh, this is the second time I've done a virtual visit. Uh, I wish we could do this in person, and I think we're getting there. I think soon, and maybe the next time we have one of these seminars, we'll do it in person. Um, I like to see your faces. I like to engage with you. And so it's a little diff different for me. It's a little difficult but we'll get through it. Uh, tonight, we're gonna to talk about uh, signs and symptoms, treatment options for erectile dysfunction and male urinary incontinence. Well, if I can get it working, here we go. Um, as uh, Cole said, this is uh, uh, to encourage an op open dialogue amongst us, uh, but we're gonna safeguard your privacy. Uh, this is me, uh, if you can't see me or if you can't see me well. Uh, I did my residency at the University of Oklahoma. I was uh, the director of uh, robotic surgery at the University of Toledo College of Medicine before I moved to Bowling Green. I was recruited to come here for uh, uh, developing a robotic program in Bowling Green 12 years ago. Uh, we started with one surgical robot, and currently in Bowling Green, we now have five surgical robots uh, between the two hospitals, and uh, it's been very successful. But one of the things that I learned very early in my career and it became a very difficult conversation to have early on, but much easier for me now that I've been doing this for 20 years, is that many of the things that we do as, as physicians or surgeons to treat one condition can cause problems, uh, such as erectile dysfunction or incontinence. And uh, we can certainly uh, manage those as well. And it's my responsibility to uh, educate everyone uh, on things that we can do to actually uh, take care of those uh, issues. So uh, we'll, we'll learn tonight that robotic surgery for prostate cancer in particular, or even open surgery for that matter, uh, for uh, prostate cancer, can result in erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence. And we have ways of treating that. Uh, again, early on in my career, I was nervous to talk about it. I was not, I would guess, possibly say childish. I didn't want to breach that subject. But I grew up and uh, I've learned how to have those conversations. I've learned how to do these treatments way back when, over 20 years ago. And uh, I'm here to share my expertise with, with you tonight. So we're gonna start with erectile dysfunction. And we're, we're gonna learn uh, a little bit more about it. Uh, what is it? Uh, why does it happen? And you might be surprised at what we hear. Many times when patients come in to see me for problems with erection, the first thing I do is look at their medication list and I can almost always determine what the cause is from just looking at their medications. ED is the inability to achieve or maintain an erection uh, that's firm enough to have successful intercourse. And it's much more prevalent than you might expect. And I think that that's why you, you've see the, seen the commercials for uh, drugs like Viagra and Cialis over the years. It happens in one in five Americans over 20 years of age and more than half of the men over 40 have some degree of an erectile dysfunction. That may be a partial erection, or they can't maintain the erection, or they can't uh, get an erection uh, at all. So to understand how we treat erections uh, or the erectile dysfunction, it's important to understand how the erection happens in the first place. We have nerves near the base of the penis that come through the pelvis near the prostate gland, that stimulate the arteries to flow and, and cause a, a dilation where there's a bunch of blood that rushes into the penis. On this side, you see the spongy tissue, which is the erectile tissue of the penis. 
and it's not full currently. And you see these broad veins around the outside. These are the veins that drain the blood from the penis. But once we're stimulated or aroused, there's a stimulation of these larger arteries to dilate or engorge. And it causes a filling of this spongy tissue quickly. As that filling happens, these veins on the outside compress. As long as the inflow is, is strong and good, these veins cannot drain the blood out. That's how we maintain an erection. And there are many different physiologic things that happen to prevent either this inflow or that allow this outflow to continue. So the, we're gonna talk about really the physical causes of erectile dysfunction, but I do wanna comment briefly on uh, the psychogenic cause, uh, causes of erectile dysfunction. It's somewhat overlooked. Uh, many times folks will come to see us because they have a problem and uh, we may not decipher a medical reason. And that may be because they have uh, a psychogenic reason. And I'm not saying that the patient itself is crazy. I'm saying that it's possible that maybe there are stresses in their lives that they don't even necessarily notice or realize that could be actually contributing to their erectile problem. But I am going to focus mostly on the physical uh, features that cause it. And most of them are vascular in nature. And you can see over here off the side, we mentioned vascular diabetes and medication, but we can actually wrap all of these things mostly into vascular. Diabetes affects the vascular system. Many of the medications we take affect the vascular system. Uh, and then of course, uh, cholesterol issues and hardening of the arteries like we see with coronary artery disease are vascular. So uh, many things will come back to that vascular discussion. Now, this slide's kind of busy, um, but this is where I get back to when I was younger and I, I didn't uh, feel comfortable talking about uh, treatments or even approaching the subject of ED. Uh, ad admittedly, back then, there were fewer treatments than there are now, but uh, it impacts much more than you might expect. Or maybe if you're a patient with ED that's listening tonight, you'll realize, you understand what, I, what this slide means. It can affect your total quality of life, either with social functioning, with your personal relationship, uh, physical functioning with the ability to have intercourse, your mental health. Maybe it will impact the way you feel about yourself or others or the way you perceive others feel about you. Uh, I won't get into further details with this, but you could probably relate briefly to this slide. So we're going to touch on diabetes first. We'll talk about heart disease. We'll talk about uh, Peyronie's disease, because that seems to be a hot topic uh, recently, and we hear a lot about Peyronie's disease currently uh, with commercials on TV. Um, but diabetes is, is kind of a, a combination problem. We have both vascular and neurogenic problems. Neurogenic, meaning the nerves that affect the uh, inflow uh, from those blood vessels, and the vasculogenic problems that diabetes can cause itself. 15.5 million men in the United States have uh, diabetes according to the 2012 census, and it may be greater than that now. Um, one in two men with a uh, history of diabetes have issues with uh, sexual uh, intercourse, and it happens earlier in men who have diabetes compared to other men who have other medical issues. Here it says in some patients, ED can be a presenting um, symptom of diabetes, that is possible, but generally speaking, we see other things that lead us to that diagnosis first, particularly men who actually have regular annual physicals and checkups. But I want to touch on the way diabetes affects the ability to have an erection. We already talked about how we get an erection. Again, those nerves stimulate the blood vessels to dilate and the blood flows in. Well, we know that diabetes affects the nerves and can cause neuropathies. We've seen countless commercials for or for, on the television for medications that help neuropathy. Well, what is neuropathy? It actually is a uh, malfunction of the nerves to actually uh, relate to sensation or actually to stimulate uh, activity with respect to either muscles or to the uh, blood vessels. 60 to 70% of men or people who have diabetes will have some sort of neuropathy. 
most commonly folks who go to see their primary care doctor with uh, diabetes will have to take off their shoes and socks and have the doctors look at their feet. And they're looking for sores or wounds that the patient may not be able to feel. Well, those same uh, sorts of uh, decreases in sensation and effectiveness of the nerves can affect our erectile function. Furthermore, diabetes is a microvascular disease. And we, we talk about endothelial dysfunction. Endothelium is the inner lining of a blood vessel and that blood vessel needs to be able to dilate. Well, if that diabetes has affected that endothelium, we can't dilate the uh, blood vessels and blood cannot flow in. So many things with diabetes can affect it. How old we are at the onset of diabetes, how long we've had diabetes, how well we control our diabetes. And we'll get back to that a little bit when we talk about uh, implant surgery. Um, people who have poor glycemic control or poor sugar control, uh, we can't do some of these uh, procedures because there's a greater risk of infection. Um, and we're going to touch on cardiovascular disease because di diabetes, we know, can cause cardiovascular disease. But sometimes the first presenting symptom of cardiovascular disease or the kind of disease that causes a heart attack or angina may start with erectile dysfunction. So, uh, and that actually is this next slide. We're talking about how diabetes and heart disease can increase the likelihood of experiencing ED, but it, heart disease almost doubles the risk for somebody to develop a heart attack. And in somebody who has diabetes and ED within two to three years or, uh, or so may develop uh, a cardiovascular event such as chest pain, or maybe have a heart attack or a stroke within three to five years. So let's talk about the heart disease then. So I, I briefly mentioned how that uh, can be a, an effect on uh, uh, erectile dysfunction, but imagine if you've got a healthy individual, particularly a guy maybe in his mid fifties who has been healthy his entire life, never had a, a problem, doesn't go to the doctor regularly, but all of a sudden develops erectile dysfunction. That might be an indicator that you could also have some underlying coronary artery disease. And I'll show you a slide, I think next, yes, here it is. Uh, these are, are depictions of the size of the arteries that we uh, are talking about. This would be the artery that allows for the inflow of blood to the penis. This is relatively the size of the arteries that supply the blood to the heart. If this vascular uh, structure is compromised and blood can't flow into the penis, it's smaller than this one, but they're actually relatively closer in size than this. But nonetheless, if this is being affected by uh, arterial disease or atherosclerosis, then very soon this may be as well. So many men who come to see me um, who are particularly healthy with ED, I will send to the cardiologist to have a stress test or uh, an EKG and echocardiogram to evaluate to see whether or not they may also have a heart problem. So how do we improve that risk? Well, we eat right, we exercise, we try to maintain our weight, we don't smoke, um, and we try to keep our cholesterol in check. Uh, that goes along with our diet, but also medications and routine annual physicals. And then the big elephant in the room, and this is where I started to focus more on ED, was prostate cancer treatment. Uh, I suspect some of the people who are on may be patients of mine, may be prostate cancer patients of mine. And what I've realized over the years, again, is that some of the things that I can do to cure prostate cancer may cause erectile dysfunction. And I'll explain how that happens here in a moment. So we talked that we talked about how the nerves themselves in the pelvis stimulate the inflow to the penis. Now the penis, actually this diagram doesn't depict it very well, but the penis is right beyond this. The nerves that actually go to the penis are right up against and adjacent to the prostate gland. When we remove the prostate gland or when we radiate the prostate gland, these nerves can be affected. Sometimes we intentionally will cut these nerves out. 
We do that on purpose if we're worried that the prostate cancer is significant and potentially growing outside of the prostate. We don't want to leave cancer behind. But in ideal candidates, we can actually spare these nerves as depicted down here and hope that we will actually prevent a patient from having long-term problems with erectile dysfunction. Now we'll go on here. I think we'll talk about overall erectile dysfunction in prostate cancer patients who have been treated it affects 25 to 75 percent of the men. Let's talk about surgery in specifics. In patients that we can spare those nerves of roughly 70% of those men within 12 months will be able to achieve a functional erection with the use of Viagra or Cialis. That's a caveat that we must include in this because some men just can't quite get there on their own. If we do not spare nerves, that rate of erectile function drops considerably. So, here it says erectile dysfunction uh, is a result of uh, robotic assisted surgery in 10 to 46% of men at one year. Roughly 70% of men will recover if we do the nerve sparing. I mentioned before radiation can cause erectile dysfunction and within 24 months of men receiving prostate radiation, regardless if it is external beam radiation or the radioactive iodine seed placement, 50% of men will have ED in two years. So I mentioned uh, that we'll talk briefly about Peyronie's disease. This is a hot topic. You've probably seen commercials for penile curvature. They don't talk a whole lot about detail. And in fact, I don't even think the commercials I've seen say the word Peyronie's, uh, but they're alluding to it. Peyronie's disease is a complication usually of trauma to the penis. It normally happens when somebody's having intercourse and they slip out and thrust forward or female on top slips out and she comes down on it and it causes a bend or a, a, a torquing of the penis. What happens is inflammation sets in in the elastic tissue that surrounds the erectile body of the penis. That trauma causes an inflammation. The body's response to an inflammation is to respond with inflammatory cells that lay down scar tissue. And ultimately, a fibrous plaque can form. What that fibro fibrous plaque does is it prevents the elasticity of the typical erectile tissue. And so this side, for instance, is not as elastic as this side. And what happens is one side will expand while the other side will not, and ultimately, we have a curve. The problems with this is it might make it painful to have intercourse for either. Oh my goodness. You hear that howling? That's my bloodhound. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. We may have to deal with that for a little bit. Um, nonetheless, it may cause pain for the male. It may cause pain for the female. It may make it difficult to penetrate. It may make it difficult to maintain or achieve an erection. Uh, and many folks will have this anxiety about the curvature. Uh, it can affect some relationships. So typically, the curvature actually happens over a period of time. And very commonly, it happens initially where you feel some discomfort. You may not have any curvature. You may not feel anything. You may develop a band in the penis itself and eventually develop uh, a curve one side to the other or upward or downward. Sometimes it can actually cause erectile dysfunction. We'll talk a little bit about uh, how we treat those things. So most recently, there's a medical management called Zyaflex. Zyaflex is a, an enzyme. We do this here in Bowling Green. We do it in our office. It's an enzyme that breaks down collagen. Collagen is the protein that actually forms scar tissue. And uh, it's a series of injections. We do two of them on uh, one week. We wait six weeks, we do two more. We wait six weeks, we do two more, and we do a final fourth series of injections. The beauty of this is it's relatively uh, non-invasive. You do have some bruising, you do have some tenderness, you do have uh, some bruising, but at the end of the day, uh, this recovers pretty quickly, and many men will actually be.
be able to straighten out enough that they can be functional and not have pain. Surgically, we can actually shorten the opposite side. That's called plication. The problem with shortening the opposite side is we uh, shorten the overall erection. We can excise the, the scar and then graft some tissue in that location to occupy the space where it was. The problem with this approach is it may de desensitize the glands penis, which makes things feel good, or it may actually cause erectile dysfunction. Lastly, scarring can reform at that location and curvature can recur. And to be quite honest, the, the big part of our discussion tonight will be uh, implantation of uh, an inflatable penile prosthesis. Penile implants can actually straighten the penis. What we do is we put one in and we break that plaque over the, the prosthesis it sounds awful, it sounds gruesome. Don't watch a video. It, it is uh, as difficult and disgusting as you might think, but it will straighten it out and you can maintain your erectile function. Um, this is best suited for somebody who already has problems with ED. So let's get into the meat of how do we treat it? So who can treat it? Well. Your general practitioner can manage some medical aspects. Urologists have the ability to manage additional aspects. And then some urologists like myself have decided to um, subspecialize a bit and, and um, do surgical procedures to actually repair this from uh, an implant perspective. Not all urologists actually implant. I have partners who do not. Um, I have partner, a partner who does. Uh, it just depends on their focus, their training, and their comfort level. So there's a wide gamut of how we treat erectile dysfunction. And if we went back 40 years, maybe, maybe a little longer, uh, vacuum devices were the only options. But we have medications, injectable treatments, implants, and urethral suppositories, which is my least favorite, and I'll explain in a moment. Let's start with the most common, the most popular. In 1998, Pfizer uh, Pharmaceuticals released uh, uh, sildenafil, also known as Viagra. Uh, what it does is it helps uh, improve the blood flow to the penis, causing a vasodilation at that endothelial level. Uh, the problem with this medication is you have to take it on an empty stomach. You have to take it about an hour before your anticipated activity. You have to wait about four, or you have roughly four hours of uh, this medication uh, effectiveness, and you need to have some sort of stimulation. You have to be aroused. It's not just going to all of a sudden happen. It's effective in many folks, roughly 50 to 85 percent of people. I think that 85 percent is generous. I think it works great in young men who are just starting to have maybe some sort of vascular compromise, but people with long-standing diabetes or prostate cancer therapies they're less effective. And many of these folks will move on to other treatment options. The most common side effect is a headache, facial flushing, uh, and stuffy nose. And I can speak to that. I once tried some myself. I didn't really need it. I wanted to see what the whole thing was about. Tried some and it worked, but I had the worst stuffy nose of my life. And my wife said that night, not tonight, honey. Uh, and that's a true story. But there's some downsides to uh, using some of these medications. If a patient is on an alpha blocker, such as Flomax or Hytrin for benign prostatic problems, uh, you have to be on that chronically and, and be well managed without, without having uh, lightheadedness or dizziness taking your medications. Adding sildenafil or uh, tadalafil will actually potentially worsen some of that lightheadedness. Uh, you cannot take it at all if you are on nitrates. Uh, there was a movie with Jack Nicholson uh, in the past. I think it was as good as it gets. I can't quite remember the name. But nonetheless, he was trying to get together with someone and uh, he had a heart attack. They took him to the emergency department. They were wanting to push nitroglycerin. And lo and behold, they said, have you taken any Viagra? He said, oh, no, I don't need this. And uh, the moment they said, well, good, because this will cause you to have a worsening of your heart attack and decrease your blood pressure and you could die. When we push our nitroglycerin, uh, he ripped his IV out, 
And the reality is, uh, although it was comical for the movie, it's true. You cannot take nitroglycerin if you're using these medications. Vacuum devices have been around a long time and uh, the technology for them is simple and it hasn't really changed a whole lot. There are pluses and minuses. This is the least invasive treatment we have. Oral medications do have their side effects. Uh, this has no systemic side effect. It's literally a vacuum that you insert your penis into. You create a seal at the base of the penis with a band on the vacuum device itself. There is a pump here that you pump it and it creates a vacuum and blood is drawn into the penis. Then you slide the band off of the device and it maintains the erection. They're very effective. Uh, but if you notice the patient satisfaction is somewhere between 68 and 80%. Uh, many men will actually move on uh, to other treatment options. And probably the biggest reason is the cumbers cumbersome nature of using a vacuum device. Some people complain that it will block your ejaculation because you're wearing the band. Some people complain of bruising. The biggest complaint I've had from patients is their penis feels cold. Um, some will say it's not sufficient enough to maintain uh, erection. Um, and the biggest complaint again is that it's cumbersome and that causes a lack of spontaneity and it kind of dulls the mood, so to speak, for the moment. So urethral suppositories, these are my least favorite options. Uh, there's a medication or uh, a prostaglandin called alprostadil, it's prostaglandin E1. Uh, this causes a vasoactive response within the penis and blood will flow into the penis. This particular device looks like a lollipop and you insert the tip of the lollipop down into the penis. This little button here has uh, the ability to dispense this pellet into the penis, and then you roll the penis in your hand until your body absorbs it through the urethra. And then what happens is that blood should rush into the erectile tissue. And it does work. It works roughly 50% of the time, but it causes significant dysuria or burning, urethral pain or burning. And most of my patients who have tried this in the past need the highest dose to actually have an effective erection, but it burns so much that they choose not to use it. Quite frankly, I stopped using this about 15 years ago. Intracavernosal injection therapy is one of my favorite options for treatment of ED. Uh, we talked about pills. Many of them you have to take on an empty stomach. Uh, you have to wait a certain period of time. You have to kind of plan for the activity. With an intracavernosal injection, if you know things are going to happen, you can give yourself an injection. By the time foreplay is over, you're ready for penetration. This medication, alprostadil, that was in the urethral suppository is the most active ingredient. In our office, we use a medication com uh, combination called triple mix. Triple mix is a compounded drug where we use fentolamine, papaverin, and alprostadil at various um, uh, concentrations in concert. And the purpose for that is to decrease the amount of overall alprostadil necessary. I'll explain why in just a moment. But they are all synergistic. They work together to cause an immediate rush of blood into the penis and allowing for a suitable erection. Um, it says here approximately 60% are satisfied in continued use. I feel like in my practice uh, that I see the folks who are actually moving forward with it, uh, it's greater than 60%. Um, many will discontinue if they're not having success. We start at low doses. And the reason we start with low doses is that we don't want an erection that lasts too long. Very commonly, I'll uh, start at the lowest dose possible and teach patients how to titrate up to the effective dose. Some people will discontinue if they get discouraged because uh, they've reached a certain benchmark and it's not effective enough for them. Uh, the, but I have other opportunities to increase the concentration of the alprostadil in their uh, injection. It says here the most common side effects are penile pain, fibrosis, priapism, or blood uh, collection or bruising under, underneath the injection site. Priapism is the one we worry about the most. That's an erection that won't go away. Um, the pain, 
we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, the alprostadil, we can actually combine at lower doses uh, with the other two drugs that I mentioned, uh, because at high doses of alprostadil, you, it's not really necessarily a pain. It's more commonly like a dull toothache in the penis. And so the higher we increase that medication, the more likely you are to have that discomfort. Uh, so some folks don't like it from that perspective, but it does work very well. The folks it works least well on are those diabetic patients. And then the inflatable penile prosthesis is probably uh, the last resort. In fact, it is the last resort in my practice, but it's a very effective treatment. Uh, there are different types of penile prosthesis. I'll describe these in a moment, but the, the device we're seeing here is what we call a three-piece device. There's a pump that we put in the scrotum. There are cylinders that we put inside the penis, and we put a reservoir behind the pubic bone. That reservoir is full of saline. When you squeeze the pump in the scrotum, it shunts the, the saline from this reservoir into the cylinders, filling them up. They expand and they cause an erection. The beauty of the inflatable penile prosthesis is that it's effective 100% um, of the time. Whenever you want an erection, it's going to work, unlike some of the oral medications that may not always work. Or maybe an injection, if you put the injection in the wrong place, it may not be effective. This is going to work each time. 98% of patients uh, report their erections are more than satisfactory. And the longevity of this device is good. The problem is this is a surgery. This takes about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes to implant. Historically, we would keep patients in the hospital overnight, but nowadays we send people home the same day. There's some bruising, there's some swelling, and there's a delay in time before I'll let you put, uh, use it. Uh, you've got to heal for a period of six weeks before we can actually uh, use the uh, device. There are some downsides as well. This is uh, a machine, so mechanical malfunction can happen. Autoinflation is when an erection happens just out of the blue and you weren't wanting it. Let's assume you lift something heavy or you cough and it pushes pressure on this reservoir. It could potentially fill this up. The devices that we have today are much better at preventing that than the ones that we had 20 years ago. And then lastly, and the most concerning risk is infection. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, particularly with diabetics. This here is a cartoon animation of how a penile prosthesis works. This is a little graphic. Uh, the next video is a little more graphic because I have a video of actually uh, a real patient pumping his up. So this is demonstrating the pump in the scrotum. It's causing a shunting of the fluid from this into the erectile cylinders. There's one on the right, there's one on the left. It causes the erection. When the patient is done, he pushes a deflation button that allows the fluid to shunt back to the reservoir. And then the patient becomes flaccid once again. This is actually a live patient demonstration, so it is graphic. Um, please be forewarned. It's important to note that all of these parts are inside the body, so there's nothing outside or exterior for a patient to see. So here he is at his flaccid state. He's pumping at the base of his scrotum where his pump is located. He's almost there. And now he's fully erect. He had his incision, what we call infrapubically. It was right here. I placed my incisions down here. He's now going to deflate it. He's going to push the button on the pump that allows for the deflation to happen, starting to go down, and then he'll squeeze the penis to release the rest of the fluid.
and now he's at his flaccid state. So this is designed as a permanent solution for erectile dysfunction, regardless of the cause of erectile dysfunction, be it vascular or neurogenic, uh, an inflatable penile prosthesis works. Um, there are some downsides. Implants uh, have been around for a very long time, but folks who are prone to infection are the ones that concern me most. I'll talk about that in a moment in the next slide. Uh, you can maintain the erection as long as you need. Uh, there's high patient and partner satisfaction. Uh, I guess it isn't the next slide that I was gonna discuss it. Oh yeah, here we go. Let's go back to this one. So they are expensive. Insurance coverage cannot be guaranteed. And when I first started doing these, uh, quite commonly, uh, Medicare would not provide for these. But more recently, I'm having less difficulty getting approval for my patients to actually have one implanted. So Medicare and most private insurance companies do pay for this. Um, of course, the patients will have their deductible and will have whatever their uh, copay may be. But for the most part, uh, I've not had difficulty over the years, most recently getting them uh, covered. The nice thing about them is they will allow for spontaneous uh, activity. There's no planning, no waiting an hour for the pill to absorb, no four hour window to work. We mentioned that there could be mechanical failures of an implantation, which could require a revision. The mechanical failure is one option or one concern for a revision, but another could be something called uh, erosion. If a device that was too large for the patient was inserted, it could potentially push through the penis or the erectile tissue. Everybody loses a little length and a little bit of girth than what they had when they were maybe 20 or 25 years old. That's expected. Um, but I had a patient of mine tell me once that a shorter erection was better than no erection. And for the most part, I think that holds true for most patients. Um, but there, it is important for patients to understand that they may lose some length and girth. The most recent prosthetics we're putting in do expand in length and girth, and some of the loss of length that they've had at the time of surgery, they may be able to regain within a year or so. Um, I'm going to go back to diabetes and here spinal cord injuries as well. There's an increased risk of infection as with diabetics, they have increased risk of infection for uh, all sorts of problems. Somebody who has uh, diabetes needs to have a hemoglobin A1C of less than eight. If their hemoglobin A1C is eight or higher, I will not schedule the surgery. Uh, I've had countless patients, even in the last month, come to see me to have these implanted who have hemoglobin A1Cs of 10 or higher, and I've told them no. And they get frustrated, but the reality is I'm protecting them and I, I want them to understand that I, I don't want to have to take it out. If one gets infected, it's going to need to be removed. And uh, it's better for them to have good sugar control preoperatively so we can reduce that risk of infection. So in short, it's a very common problem. Again, uh, uh, more than one in five men over the age of 20 are going to have some problem throughout their life. 40% of men over 40 are already having some uh, issue. Maybe it's uh, loss of uh, correction, uh, difficulty maintaining their erections or maybe not a, a firm enough erection. We have multiple treatment options. The end result uh, or the last resort is a penile implant, but it is a permanent solution. It works uh, and they work when you want it to work, unlike some of the medical options. I'm going to move along and we're going to talk a little bit about stress incontinence. Incontinence um, that we're going to talk about here is most commonly after having prostate surgery for prostate cancer. You're going to see stress urinary incontinence listed on the slides ahead as SUI or SUI. So I may say SUI uh, just so you know what I'm speaking of. So um, bladder leakage or stress incontinence is when the sphincter muscle is damaged or weakened and it cannot shut off the flow of urine. And it's not always just the sphincter muscle. I'll explain some of the physics behind flow 
uh, particularly within a conduit. But usually this is when we cough, sneeze, lift something, bend over, pick something up or squat, and we lose some urine. Uh, after surgery for prostate cancer, it says here, studies suggest as many as 50% of men report leakage immediately after prostate surgery. Uh, I disagree with this. I think it's near 100% of people will have some leakage initially. Long-term, in my practice, only about 7% have long-term incontinence, and that's after 12 months. Here, uh, we're saying 9 to 16%. Usually by about three months, 80% of men are dry. Roughly half a million men are currently suffering from SUI in the United States related, I'm sorry, in the world related, related to prostate surgery. So uh, I find the physiology of the urinary process or what we call micturition fascinating. Um, as infants, we were always incontinent. What would happen is the bladder would fill up it would send a signal through the nerves to your spinal cord. The spinal cord would send a signal to the brain, but didn't get a response back from the brain. So the spinal cord took it upon itself to send a signal back to the bladder for the bladder to squeeze. It would increase pressure. The sphincter muscle would receive a uh, message to relax and out comes the urine. Well, as we mature, we learn how to control our urine. The bladder has two purposes, really. One, it's a, it's a reservoir to store urine, but it's also a muscle to actually evacuate urine. It's a very complicated symphony of events where the bladder and the sphincter work together in order to either maintain or to evacuate urine. When we have prostate surgery, uh, this is affected uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, the previous slide mentioned, uh, or the slide before the last mentioned the possibility of damage or weakening of the sphincter muscle, and that's true, but there's more associated with that in a moment. Uh, we can also see patients have incontinence because of a neurologic disorder, some breakdown in that uh, symphony that I mentioned where there's the communication between the spinal cord, the bladder, the sphincter, uh, surgery for enlargement of the prostate, radiation therapy, or even pelvic trauma. And this is usually when somebody has had a pelvic fracture and potential damage to the nerves or to the sphincter itself. So I'm going to speak about how we treat it for men who have had prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is very common. Uh, nearly 200,000 people are diagnosed each year and 70,000 of them actually have their prostate removed. And this is how I got into some of that prosthetic surgery that I was mentioning. So again, going back to my younger years where I was uncomfortable talking about erectile function and uncomfortable about talking uh, or talking about some of my uh, potential complications associated with surgery with respect to incontinence, I didn't wanna talk about it so much. But the reality is we know that some of the treatments that we have to cure a cancer can cause another side effect. And when we remove the prostate, it's situated between the bladder and the urethra. The urethral sphincter is right here. This isn't a great picture, but it does kind of give an idea. You can see a cutoff would be right here. We transect the urethra on one side of the prostate and we cut the prostate away from the bladder, separating the bladder from the urethra. And then we show the bladder back to the urethra and we put a catheter in. The sphincter muscle is roughly here. When we remove the prostate, we are shortening the conduit from the bladder, oops, go back. We are shortening the conduit from the bladder to the end of the penis. If you look at the physics of resistance to, of flow through a conduit, the physics is very simple. The radius of a conduit, as well as the length of the conduit can change the resistance to flow. Well, if we're removing, let's say an inch and a half to two inches of prostate tissue, we're removing an inch and a half to two inches of the urethra, not on the outside of the body, but on the inside of the body, we're shortening that conduit. That increase, or sorry, decreases the resistance. The longer the conduit, the greater the resistance. The shorter the conduit, the less resistance. Furthermore, 
the urethral diameter or radius within the prostate tissue itself is narrower than it is elsewhere. So by taking away some of that narrow urethra, we are actually decreasing the resistance to flow. Not to mention that the sphincter muscle is close by and is weak and potentially damaged from the surgery itself. This results in, in the increased risk of incontinence. Um, this also explains why women have more stress incontinence issues than men. Their urethra is short. It's only about two centimeters long. Uh, a male urethra is multiple centimeters long, increasing the resistance to flow. So it's normal after a prostatectomy to have incontinence. It's often restored during the first year. Again, in my practice, 93% of men are dry by 12 months, 80% are dry by three months, and it's partially uh, related to uh, some rehabilitation that we put all of our patients in. But not everybody is able to regain their uh, continence. We have ways of treating that. We'll go on to talk about those. Who treats these? Well, urologists do, and of course, prosthetic urologists. Again, some urologists don't feel comfortable or didn't have the training necessary to ins insert the prosthetic devices. But before we get to devices, let's talk about how we manage. Well, we can reduce the amount of fluid we take in. We can plan for restroom breaks and we call that timed voiding. Go every two hours, even if you don't feel like you need to. So you empty your bladder so you don't risk leaking. We can do pelvic floor physical therapy. And this is a huge part of my practice. Every prostate cancer patient goes to see a physical therapist to learn pelvic floor therapy. The stronger we can make the pelvic muscles, the sooner they're gonna get dry. This involves also Kegel exercises. Biofeedback is not well paid for by your insurance company. It's labor intensive for the patient as well as for uh, a practice. Very few practices are doing this currently, but it is a type of therapy that is used in the office setting. And of course, then there's coping. Immediately after taking a catheter out, after surgery, everybody needs to wear a pad, or I prefer the term pull-up uh, rather than diapers. We use the Depends pull-ups. Some people need to wear a condom catheter to catch the leakage from the end of the penis, but they have their inherent problems. And then there are penile clamps called uh, Cunningham clamps. This is an example here. The problem with a Cunningham clamp is that you need to take it off periodically so you don't damage or hurt the penis. But coping has its cost too. So if somebody has to wear a pull-up for um, five years and you wear five a day, it can cost up to $7,000. It's very expensive. The condom catheters can actually cause sores or irritation on the penis and may potentially be linked to infections. Excuse me. And I mentioned already the penile clamps can cause uh, discomfort to the penis and need to be removed frequently. So there are two surgical options currently for uh, post-prostatectomy incontinence. I'll talk uh, briefly about the male sling and then I'll talk more about the artificial sphincter. I'm actually not a big fan of the sling. I started doing the sling about 15 years ago and within two years I stopped using it. A sling is what we often do for female incontinence. The mechanism of the incontinence is a little different for the female to the male. Uh, a sling in a female provides sort of a backboard for the urethra to be um, a, a buttress uh, for the urethra, frankly, for that to, to actually cause coaptation of the mucosa and keep the urine from leaking. With the male sling, it's actually pulling the urethra upward, uh, changing the uh, angle of the urethra and affecting its ability uh, for continence. Uh, it's not difficult to put one in. It doesn't take very long, um, but my opinion is the success of it is not as good as the artificial sphincter. With the male sling, you have to be very careful to be cognizant of your physical activity for the next six to eight weeks or it'll loosen. And if that happens, it will be ineffective. I had a patient that I put one in two weeks after his procedure. He was dry. He was happy. He called me and said, I want to go camping. And I said, don't do any heavy lifting. The following week, he called and said, I was in the back of my pickup truck. I jumped out. I heard a pop and I wet my pants. 
uh, and he was incontinent. I told him not to do anything heavy and he jumped out of a truck. Uh, ultimately, we put an artificial sphincter in. An artificial sphincter is very much like the penile prosthesis. It's a three-piece device where there's a reservoir with fluid, a balloon that wraps around the urethra, and a pump that's within the scrotum. We call that the cuff is the balloon, the control pump uh, is the uh, pump in the scrotum, and the pressure regulating balloon is the reservoir that holds the fluid that inflates this cuff. This cuff actually squeezes the urethra shut, and uh, it increases the resistance to flow, again, by decreasing the radius of the uh, conduit. The sling is a minimally invasive procedure. It says normal activities can be resumed in one to two weeks. I would argue that you need at least six weeks for this to heal into place. If you start lifting too heavy or jump out of a truck, it's not gonna work. Um, the nice thing about it is you don't have to push any buttons or pumps. Uh, it works on its own, uh, and there is an advantage from that perspective. But the artificial urinary sphincter is the gold standard that everything that we use to treat post-prostatectomy incontinence is measured against. This is the most effective treatment option. If you look at the 15-year data, 85% of these are still functioning and I'm working well. About 15% of them will require revision, and I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, and of course, there's always that risk of infection because it is a prosthetic device and it's a higher risk in those who have diabetes or spinal cord injuries. I'm going to show you a cartoon on how an artificial sphincter works. So just as the penile prosthesis, everything is on the inside. We have a balloon with, uh, it's a reservoir. We call this a pressure regulating balloon. The fluid in here is under pressure all the time. There's the pump in the scrotum and the cuff around the urethra. This cuff is always uh, inflated and it's squeezing the urethra shut. You use the pump to squeeze to deflate it and after 30 seconds or so, that pressure in the balloon that's the reservoir will reactivate that cuff and fill it back up. So we do have options for treatment of incontinence post-surgery, and it's something we offer right here in Bowling Green, and we have for 12 years. Uh, and many people don't realize that these treatments exist. And in addition, many people don't realize that we offer them those treatments here locally. So as with anything, we have potential risks and side effects. Of course, the sling might not work. It might be that it's in there so tight that you can't urinate. Uh, you might have uh, post-operative pain, as I would expect with any surgery, maybe some swelling and bruising, irritation from your wound, and of course, a foreign body response is scarring. Uh, with the artificial sphincter, again, it's a machine. So any machine may fail and that could cause a risk for revision. Uh, erosion of the urethra is a concern. That's where maybe somebody has had previous radiation or they had a, a sphincter that was put in too tight or they got an infection in that area where the actual device would erode through the urethra. This is very rare. The more pro uh, common problem that I see is that you develop something called atrophy Atrophy is where the urethra itself would wither, and if it withers, the uh, sphincter cannot cause enough, enough compression or coaptation of the urethra to increase that resistance to flow and the patients start to leak again. Certainly, uh, if the patient can't have the dexterity to actually use the pump, they can have problems with retention. And then, of course, lastly, infection, as I mentioned again, is greatest risk uh, with a diabetic patient, but less than 2%. Again, the, the little disclaimer that insurance coverage cannot be guaranteed, but in my practice, the patients who need these most, for the most part, are having coverage. We do pre-certify every, uh, every patient. And, and to that end, in addition, uh, I mentioned the diabetic patients with the penile prosthesis. I'm going to mention it again with the artificial sphincters. You have to have a hemoglobin A1C of less than eight. I will not put one in. 
And it's not me being a mean surgeon. It's, it's thinking of your best interests uh, and reducing that risk of that complication. What's most important is that people know that these things exist and that they can certainly approach us. Uh, we're happy to talk about it, show you the devices. We have them in the office. Uh, you can play with it and see what it's like uh, and ask tons of questions. I, ha I have plenty of answers. One of the problems with this discussion, uh, these are references for, for the talk, uh, is that I could probably spend the next two hours talking about each one of the treatment options for ED and each one of the treatment options for, for stress incontinence, but we don't have that kind of time. And I know uh, it might be boring for somebody who's uh, non-medical. Um, I can discuss the physiology, the anatomy, uh, the physics behind things, um, but we have those options to treat and I'm happy to, to entertain questions in a moment. Cole, are we going to hear from Herschel first? And yeah. Then question? Yeah, what we'll do right now, we actually have a, a patient champion that's, you know, taking time out of his day to come and talk about his personal experience um, with device selection and, and what he's experienced thus far. So without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce Herschel. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be on here this evening. And Dr. Rudder, thank you for that wonderful presentation. As always. Thanks, Herschel, for being here. I think it's important for the patients to hear what you have to say because you have a very unique perspective and I, I can't wait to, for you to share it. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Herschel Chalk. I am a 25 year, two time prostate cancer survivor. I, um, I had a radical prostatectomy where they cut me from my navel to my scrotum. I had 35 radiation treatments, and I've also had bladder neck surgery. Any one of the three could cause incontinence. The three of them together, for me, it was like a flood. I was wearing nine diapers a day. Uh, Doc calls them pull-ups. I call them diapers. They're the same thing. But um, it, it got to a point to where as I would be out somewhere, sit down in a chair, and all the water would come out. My pants would be wet, the chair would be wet. I did not know that I was wet. And so it got to the point to where as I got, I, I didn't want to go out too much. And um, it created a lot of problems. So I went and talked to my doctor and he said we could do an artificial urinary sphincter. I said, doc, I want to do it. I got the sphincter. I went from nine diapers a day to one. I still wear one now because of the fact that I leak a little bit. But going from nine to one, I don't have any complaints. I'm happy. I've never been perfect in my life, so I'm not worried about being perfect now. But the thing is, I do have some control. I, I, I don't pass up too many restrooms. Whether I have to go or not, a lot of times I will just go to relieve myself just to be safe, to try to keep the leakage down. Um, I put on the one diaper in the morning. I take it off in the evening or sometimes the next morning. It just depends. But the thing is, uh, I'm not getting my pants wet. I'm not being embarrassed when I'm out in public. I do feel safe. And it's no problem because when you go in, have to go and you go into the restroom, all I do is open up my pants, push the button, relieve myself, fasten my pants back up and go on about my business. Nobody knows what I have. And I'm not worried about anybody looking or anything because I'm just in there for one reason and that's to relieve myself. And it works very well, very well. I've had my sphincter for a total of 17 years. After 14 years, after 13 years, it wore out and I had to get it replaced. 
So I'm on my second one and I've had it for four years now. It works just as good as the first one. And uh, as I say, it just brings joy to me because of the fact I don't have to worry about uh, my pants being wet and so forth. It's, it's a joy. So if, if you're having a, uh, a big battle with incontinence, I would suggest that you talk to the doctor about the artificial urinary sphincter and uh, it will make you feel better. Now, he's not going to promise you that you will be dry, but you will be drier than you are. And that's a big difference. And that's a big help. Now, we move on and talk about ED. That is a very touchy subject for men. We don't want anybody to know naturally that we peeing on ourselves. And we definitely don't want anybody to know that we cannot perform sexually. We keep it a secret. And a lot of times we even keep it a secret from the doctor. But the important thing is to know that there is a remedy. And that's what counts. Whether you want it today or you want it next month or next year, there is a remedy for you when you get ready for it. Now, I've tried everything that Doc talked about. I tried Viagra. It didn't do nothing for me but give me a headache. I tried the, uh, the pump. And it was okay. I'd take and put the tube over the penis. And, and you know, well, first off, I'd be laying up. We'd be playing around. And I'd say, wait a minute, honey, I'll be right back. Go in the bathroom, get the tube out, put it over the penis, pump it up, get my erection, slide the band on. And when I went back in the bedroom, she'd be asleep. And I'd go over and shake her, honey, honey, I'm ready now. You got to wake up. So she'd wake up and we'd have some fun and everything. But after a while, to me, that got to be a little uh, tiresome. It got to be uh, something that I didn't enjoy as much because I hated waking her up, you know? And, and the fact that um, I had to, it, it had no spontaneity. It was all the fact that I'd have to go to the bathroom and pump up and everything. And that got to be a little bit too much. Then I tried what they call mutes. Muse was the one where you take the little uh, dopper, stick in the head of the penis, release the medicine, massage the penis, and you're supposed to get an erection. Well, that didn't work for me. I never got an erection. I just got a lot of urethral burn. So that was uncomfortable. And then I went to the doctor. I said, doc, none of this is working. Is there anything else? He said, yeah, we got penile injection. I knew what he meant when he said penile, and I knew what he meant when he said injection. But to me, they didn't go together. I could not picture taking a needle, sticking in my penis for me to get an erection. But like most men, in order to get an erection and be able to have sex, we'll try anything. So I went on and tried it. And uh, when the doctor gave me a shot, it worked very well. He asked me, gave me the shot. I went home. He asked me how it was. And I said, Doc, that works good. Uh, we go, I'm getting ready to go on vacation. He said, well, good. I'm going to teach you how to do it. He gave me the needle and told me to give myself a shot. I couldn't do it. My hands were shaking. The hand was shaking with the needle in it. My hand was shaking with my penis in it and everything. And it was just difficult for me to give myself the shot. And I got to thinking, I'm going on vacation with this pretty woman. And it would really be nice if I could have a, a little bit of sex while I'm on vacation, make vacation a whole lot better. So I gave myself the shot. It didn't work. 
doc told me take the medicine home and try it for four or five times and see how I do. I tried it. And every time I tried it, it didn't work. I could not get an erection. So I called the doc and I told him, I said, doc, I got a problem. He said, what's your problem? I said, I can't have you in my bedroom at night when I want to have sex giving me a shot. He said, well, come on in and we'll talk. So we went in and we talked about the penile implant. Gentlemen, I want to tell you, first of all, right now, if you get the penile implant, you make sure that you, when you heal, you ask the doc when you can walk and do some exercises and so forth because you need to build up your cardiovascular. Because one thing about us men, we will pump it up, go to use it for the first time. We'll try to make up for all the time we done missed right then. And if that's the case and she lets you, I want to make sure you got some energy. Because once you pump yourself up, I don't care if it's two minutes, two hours, or two days, it's going to stay pumped up until you hit the release button to let it down. It's going to give you a lot of joy and a lot of pleasure. It's also going to give you a lot of confidence. The confidence that you lost during this time frame and trying to get erections and everything and, and getting disgusted when nothing works or, or when something works sometimes and, and when you want it to work most, it won't work at all. So the implant is going to give you everything that you've been missing. And when I say that, what I mean is it's going to build your confidence back up because you will know each and every time that you will be able to satisfy your partner. It's also going to give you the ability to have sex whenever you or your partner wants it. If you want it three, four times a day, you can do that. It's up to you and your partner. But the main thing is to keep in mind the fact that we do not feel total and complete if we can't get an erection. We don't feel like we're a whole man. Once you get the implant, you will have it and you will be able to feel total and complete again. And even if you don't want that much sex, it's the fact that you will be able to have it when you want to have it. And the implant is going to make sure that you can do that. It brings joy. I've had my implant a total of 18 years. I'm on my second one. And I've had it for four years now. And um, it brings me joy. It brings me happiness. If anything were to happen to me tonight and, and it wasn't working or something, I'd be on my phone, on the phone to the doctor tomorrow and I'd let him know we got to have surgery. Because as long as I'm alive, I'm going to have an implant. And the main reason is not so I can have sex every night, but so I can have it if I desire to have it. And it helps me to feel total and complete. It's something to think about. And I want to leave you with this last thing. If you happen to be talking about it to your partner and your partner says, oh, you know, it's not necessary. You don't need it. But you're saying to yourself, well, I think I do. Herschel, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay. It cut out just then. You said uh, if you're debating on it and questioning it with your partner, uh, that was the last thing that everybody heard. OK, um, if you're debating on it, your partner tries to tell you it's not necessary and you don't need it. OK, am I coming through now? Yes, you are. OK, and your partner says it's not necessary, you don't need it. Then, gentlemen, you got to think about yourself. 
love yourself and think about what's going to make you happy. Because if you're not happy, you can't make nobody else happy. You got to be happy first. And you can always say to her, if you had a double mastectomy, what would you do? Probably about 85% of the women would go ahead and say they're going to get something, a padded bra uh, or something artificial and everything so they can look natural and they can feel like they're a woman. It's the same way with a man. With a woman, it's external. With a man, it's internal. If you don't feel like you're a complete man and everything, you're not going to be happy. So you got to make sure that you're happy first.